Welcome to Montana Wolf of Air Council and International Development Studies Joint Event. And um, happy to see those of you who are here in the room. And also, um, this is streaming online as well. And I just want to say hi to those online. Um, I will say a few words about international development study programs, then I'll pass it to, to uh, Chris Heislop to introduce you to Montana World Affairs Council before we start our seminar today. Um, I am Phyllis Ngai, the Director of International Development Studies Program, uh, IDS. IDS offers an interdisciplinary minor, a graduate certificate, and the preschool prep certificate program for students who are interested in um, exploring the world, developing a global mindset, and serving the underserved. If you're interested in helping to contribute to solving global challenges, this program is for you. Ideas includes a long list of interesting courses for students to choose from. We actually have over 70 courses on the list. Uh, they are courses from all over campus. Uh, they are offered uh, by over 15 departments across campus. And these courses provide you with uh, options to develop an in-depth understanding uh, of um, a wide range of global issues. So um, if you're interested, let me know. There are some brochures uh, on the table and check out our website. And um, this is a program that fits any majors uh, on campus. So hope to talk to you about the program. If you're interested, just let me know. I'm gonna pass it on to Chris Heisler to talk to you about Montana World Affairs Council. Thank you very much, Phyllis and Peter and everybody here. I'm Chris Hislop. I'm the executive director from the Montana World Affairs Council. And we are a nonpartisan nonprofit that uh, engages Montana schools and communities in world affairs. Uh, and we do that through programs like this. We've got a great partnership here at the University of Montana and other universities around the state. Uh, we travel a lot to schools and communities uh, with distinguished speakers on topics of the day to try to help people understand what's going on and why does it matter to Montana and to Montanans. And if you'd like to know more, check out the website at www.montanaworldaffairs.org. And with that, let's kick it off. At the beginning of this year, armed conflict and political persecution had dislocated more than 100 million people around the world. Droughts, floods, wildfires, and sea level rise had uh, dislocated about over a million people a year as well. While Phyllis and I were researching and co-authoring a book focused on contemporary displacement, Chris went and helped displaced Ukrainians. And we thought that sharing our insights and our highlights from these overlapping and interconnected experiences merited today's panel discussion. So I will begin by talking a little bit about the origins of the book, and then Phyllis is going to follow, and Chris will then uh, come, chime in with his experiences in, in Ukraine. The book is entitled Migrant Health and Resilience, Transnational Competence in Conflict and Climate Displaced Situations. And there are flyers here for those who are interested. As Susan Martin writes in her forward to the book, and I quote, mass displacement, climate change, and public health are three of the defining issues of the 21st century. The armed conflict arising from Russia's invasion of Ukraine is one of the most recent drivers of global population displacement. Our book was motivated in part by recognition that although emergency funding for humanitarian relief has surged in recent decades, the response to displacement and is deficient and typically disconnected to sustainable development and the long-term needs 
of dislocated persons and their hosts. So our number one objective in writing the book is to contribute to preparing current and aspiring humanitarian respondents with skills needed for enhancing resilience, health, integration, and well-being in displacement contexts. For this purpose, we turn to transnational competence or TC, a skill-based framework initially proposed in 2002 by myself, along with the iconic professor of international relations, James Rosenau. Transnational competence places priority on skill, acquisition, and application. That is what you do, for what ends, and with what consequences. TC involves a design of both education and training initiatives that are aimed at developing five sets of clearly differentiated capabilities, analytic, emotional, creative or imaginative, communicative, and functional. Most of our chapter one is devoted to developing and documenting the TC framework. Here, I will briefly touch on just one or two key dimensions of each skilled domain. Let's start with analytic competence. Analytic competence is not accumulated knowledge of facts and data per se. Rather, it is the ability to acquire, select, assemble, and interpret, it, interpret relevant knowledge and understanding. For example, the ability to, to discern stakeholder needs, the ability to analyze opportunities and constraints, the ability to analyze risks and benefits. Emotional competence involves passion, passion to serve, coupled with humility, ability to discern unspoken messages converted, conveyed by people with vastly different backgrounds from one's own. That is often referred to as empathy. Creative competence is ability to mobilize the synergistic relevance of diverse perspectives and advance alternative resolutions that involve syntheses of multi-source insights and aspirations. Communicative competence involves skill in interpretation and in listening and using an interpreter, proficiency in nonverbal communication, and the ability to facilitate mutual self-disclosure. Functional competence brings all five of these competencies together in ways that allow for successful accomplishment of tasks and projects. The basis, the very base of functional competence is the ability to develop and maintain trusting interpersonal relationships with persons from diverse backgrounds. Also, functional competence involves the ability to collaborate in transnational teams, networks, and partnerships. And very important part of functional competence is advocacy skill, the ability to advance transformative changes in the very conditions that constrain migrant justice and well being. TC works best when all stakeholders are competent. In a minute, Phyllis will identify which specific TC skills are most critical for humanitarian respondents. But first, I would like to uh, briefly introduce the five contributors to migrant health and resilience. I'm especially delighted to say that all five have a University of Montana connection. Dr. Phyllis Boyan Nye, is director of the International Development Studies and Migration Studies programs and clinical associate professor in the School of Social Work at the University of Montana. She contributed specialized knowledge of intercultural training for refugees. Dr. Yuha Wito, director of the Independent Evaluation Office of the World Bank's Global Environmental Facility, also is a member of UM's international um, Development Studies External Advisory Council. He contributed extensively regarding the need for ongoing and appropriate evaluation for effective response and recovery 
in situations of climate and conflict-induced displacement. UM alumna Diana Dykow is a Polish multilingual psychologist who has worked with displaced persons in Greece, Ukraine, Poland, and Slovakia. She contributed valuable trauma-based insights based on her field experiences as a responder working with refugees. Dr. Susan Martin, who contributed the book's foreword, is Professor Emerita in International Migration at Georgetown University and UM Adjunct Professor of Political Science, where she teaches core courses for the Migration Studies Program. And I'm currently Professor Emeritus in Political Science here at the University of Montana. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. And I'm gonna take about 10 minutes to highlight some training for uh, humanitarian responders that are included in the book, then I'll pass it on to Chris, and he will talk about his experiences working uh, in the field of humanitarian assistance uh, in Ukraine, more recent experience. Um, our book recommends a range of transnational competence training for humanitarian responders, as well as migrants and their host communities. Because of time, so today I would like to highlight the training needs of um, humanitarian responders that are included in um, chapter five of our book. If you're interested in training recommendations for migrants and host communities, please see chapter six of this book. Um, crisis responders, uh, sometimes call them humanitarian care providers who arrive on the scene to help forcibly displaced people survive, adjust, integrate, and prosper, encompass multiple nationality, cultural backgrounds, and professional backgrounds, and they rely on a range of, a wide range of funding sources. Their numbers likely exceed 300,000 today, and the challenges they encounter increasingly are complex and long-term. Whereas humanitarian responders have addressed emergencies, which is something we think of when we think of humanitarian response, our book emphasizes that sustainable development built resilience to emergencies. The reinforcing continuum of short-term emergency assistance and long-term efforts to build socioeconomic capabilities and health and well-being is explicitly, explicitly recognized in the UN's 2016 Agenda for Humanity. Our research indicates that existing training courses in the field of development studies, health, and migration typically are simply not effective in light of frequent confrontations with multiple boundary crossing demands. Increasingly, NGOs and other responders recognize the need to provide competency-based uh, training for their workforce. Building transnational competence among the responders as recommended in our book, offers a humane and promising way forward for engaging resilience in the interests of individual well being and sustainable development in conflict and climate dislocation contexts. So, what should TC training, transnational company training for humanitarian responders, focus on? As Peter mentioned earlier, there are five TC dimensions. Um, let's start with the first dimension, analytic competence. I'm going to be brief on this. Um, yeah, you can, oh, was working earlier. Um, I'm gonna highlight uh, some key points on the side, but then add a couple uh, points just orally. Yeah, that's, that's good, thanks, Chris. Yeah. Um, some of the analytic skills that we recommend be included in training for responders are highlighted on this first slide here. 
The book has a lot more details. Here, I want to mention a few key skills that tend to be overlooked. To help enhance humanitarian responders' capabilities for healthcare, resilience building, and sustainable development, TC training needs to nurture the ability to understand the socio ecological, multicultural, economic, educational, service delivery, and political context of displaced populations and their hosts. Um, humanitarian aid providers need to recognize that displaced persons have multiple identities and diverse perspectives shaped in large part by their social experiences. To help enhance the resilience and well being of migrants, particularly those informally settled in urban areas, responders need to be able to analyze intergovernmental relations as well as global connections. Healthcare responders, uh, in particular, also need to develop understanding of how the interacting global, global and local roots of health disparities affecting populations of immediate concern. These are just some examples of analytic competencies recommended in our book, um, which also includes suggested training strategies for helping to achieve these target skills. Um, Emotional competence is, is the next one I want to just briefly talk about. In terms of building emotional competence, here are some examples of the skills recommended for training for humanitarian responders. In the book, we note that recognition of the emotional context of human, humanitarian work and the emotional competence uh, required for social justice work with migrants prepares responsible respondents to engage with their hearts as well as their heads and hands. Uh, sometimes we think of humanitarian workers, they're doing hands-on work. But here we um, highlight the fact that uh, emotional competence is critical. The ability to act with humility during interactions with displaced population and homes populations is necessary for overcoming barriers associated with socioeconomic disparities and power differ differentials. Preparation for working in displacement context further requires anticipatory empathy, which involves considering the resilience, capabilities, and strengths of people and community. And quickly, we move on to the creative competence. Again, this is an overlooked area in a lot of training. In terms of creative competence, here are some skills recommended for humanitarian responders on, on the slide. Um, but again, the book has a lot more details. What I want to highlight here is that in the book, we recommend training in creative competence because humanitarian responders need to be prepared to improvise and innovate on the spot. I'm sure Chris can share a lot more uh, about this area, the stories he probably can share that he has to improvise on the spot. Humanitarian responders need not only, they need not only a willingness, but also skills to be learners in the local context and the ability to integrate different perspectives. Um, let's move on to communicative competence. And uh, in terms of communicative competence, some suggested skills for TC training are included on this slide. In addition to language skills, skills for working with interpreters, those are the skills we normally think about. But what vital communicative competence includes the ability to provide encouragement and support for migrant population through, for example, attending to the intricacies of intercultural communication. Here at the University of Montana, I teach a course on intercultural communication, and um, it takes some training in order to get good at it. Responders need to develop communicative skills to foster mutual understanding among the stakeholders and service providers of a wide range of backgrounds. For example, in order to communicate recommendations in a responsible and sensitive manner 
that support migrants to make their own informed decisions as opposed to just telling them what to do. Humanitarian responders need to be trained to communicate based on an understanding of power and privileges. The last area, functional competence. Um, here are some highlights on the slide. In our book, we recommend that TC training for humanitarian responders uh, includes efficacy skills, which again, tend to be under the radar, uh, but are critically important. The efficacy skills that are particularly relevant to responders are the ability to support coalition and collective action that aim to change policy and practice and the ability to initiate, mobilize, and organize action to challenge social injustice. Community engagement is an emerging strength in humanitarian responsiveness. Given the immediate challenges that confront humanitarian responders in most crisis situations, it is important to initiate translational competence preparation during the windows of opportunity that precede engagement. These windows can be long-term, in which case higher education university, universities can be involved, and or short-term, which utilize an initial pre-departure or on-arrival training program. In terms of training strategies, that might be the more interesting part um, uh, for most of you. The book offers a range of recommendations for pre-departure training, on arrival training, higher education initiatives, transnational learning networks for humanitarian responders. Although I don't have time to talk about training for migrants and host communities, which actually is my passion area, chapter six of the book elaborates on practical guidelines for adaptable site-based training aimed at preparing displaced populations and their hosts with TC skill sets that will enhance their capabilities in conflict and climate dislocation context. We need to remember that migrants and hosts are centrally positioned to contribute to adaptation, resilience, and sustainable development. Prospects of positive migrant health outcomes also are greatly enhanced when participants themselves, as well as providers, are transnationally competent. For displaced people, uh, chapter six of the book covers all five dimensions of TC training. The book talks about TC for migrants' personal development, TC for integrating into their new countries, their new home communities, and TC for sustainable development that migrants are positioned to contribute. Regarding host communities, the book includes recommendations for TC training for social justice work and TC for helping. Too much to share, uh, too little time. I will stop here and hand it over to Chris to illustrate the kind of skills needed for humanitarian professionals, specifically in the Ukraine context. This one is, oh, there we go. Thank you very much, Phyllis and Peter, for that. Phyllis, I think we have to manually click the slides, uh, I, I, I think. Um, at any rate, um, thanks a lot for that presentation. I'll just say quickly off the top of, of listening to both of you, I, I did humanitarian aid for 25 years, and I can tell you that um, you know what was presented very succinctly, uh, incredibly useful for me, you know, at a, at, you know, after a long career for people undoubtedly who are just entering uh, humanitarian affairs and also for people just have an interest in it. So thanks a lot for that. I found it really, really very interesting. I thought maybe I would focus some of my remarks on my time in Ukraine this summer. Um, prior to coming to Missoula four years ago, I did spend 25 years as a humanitarian aid worker all around the world um, in, in just about every place where there has been an aid operation. Um, starting in the mid uh, '90s in the during the Balkan Wars, and um, you know uh, across Africa and across Asia, and, and too many places to mention. Um, but um, I that has just given me um, a certain insight, I think, into into the field work. And this summer, I had the opportunity to go to Ukraine, so I wanted to share with you a few things that I think resonate very closely with Peter and Phyllis's work here. 
Um, uh, but taking my comments more from the ground level and, and the aid work and giving you some idea about what's happening in Ukraine and what does that mean for humanitarian aid and what does it mean for Ukraine going ahead. So um, I, I'm, I have four photos for you and each photo I'll describe, but then I want to explain a story underneath that photo. So what you're seeing uh, in this first photo is a, 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 a Russian Grad missile. It looks like a water pipe, but it's a missile uh, that's impacted in the asphalt of a road in a small village in eastern Ukraine. Um, and so that's what you're seeing. You're seeing an unexploded missile. Um, but underneath this picture is a very important uh, dynamic within a humanitarian situation, which is to say there are uh, millions of tons of unexploded ordnance around the world uh, in areas of conflict, Ukraine being one of the most heavily littered um, and heavily landmined places now in the world. And so everywhere you go in areas of conflict, you will find um, munitions that are unexploded. And, um, you know, for the, the technical um, thing behind this is the stuff that's sitting there, um, it's been fired. So it's live, the fuse is off. And so um, a swift kick or a poke at these things uh, will blow it up. And of course, that's a great danger to civilians who are um, you know, in a humanitarian situation, but in this case, maybe trying to return to their homes and unable to because uh, it's littered with uh, extensive um, uh, I, you know, unexploded ordnance or war junk, uh, shells, bombs, missiles, what have you. Um, so that ends up being a very significant obstacle to a return to normal livelihoods and a return um, even in a place like this where, where you're looking here, um, there has not been active fighting for 10 months but the um, presence of these missiles and bombs and landmines is prohibiting people from moving back and, and restoring their lives. So let's go to the next one. Um, this is a picture of uh, a typical apartment block uh, in the south central city of Kherson in Ukraine. Uh, what you're seeing here uh, obviously is a very heavily damaged um, urban uh, apartment building. This is not a military installation. This is a civilian apartment building. And if you look closely at the picture, you see there's a big space in between the two buildings in the forefront. That used to be the building, which has collapsed and the rubble has been removed. Um, so the on the front side of this, you're seeing a, a heavily damaged building. The reason that that was damaged was um, uh, an attack by the Russian military on this area. It was a very heavy bombardment, um, and it's well known around Ukraine because it's one of the worst attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure um, that led to 46 deaths, including five children, and 70 people were injured. So it's what you're seeing there, but underneath this is the idea that, um, of course, within conflict, civilians are often caught up. Um, and it's it's for the the humanitarians and you know referencing that the skill set in the in the book, you know to understand and to be able to communicate with people what is actually um, you know what is happening to civilians in conflict. Many of the images we see of Ukraine and other uh, areas of conflict are typically people in uniform, tanks, guns, and bombs, and we don't often see the effect on civilians. This is one of them. Um, in Ukraine, over 10,000 people, civilians, have been killed, um, of which um, uh, 1,500 at least, or an estimated, were children. Um, and, and the typical calculation is multiply that by three or four to, to come to the number of people who are wounded. Um, and so a, a large number of civilians are um, killed and are injured and deeply affected by the conflict, um, as kind of shown in this uh, photo. If you could go to the next one. This young man is standing in front of his school in a typical village in eastern Ukraine. If you look behind, obviously the school has been totally destroyed. Um, and so that's what you're seeing in the picture. The story behind this picture is a, a very common one in conflict whereby um, a, a military will typically billet their soldiers in large buildings like schools, hospitals, and factories where you can put a lot of people under one roof. Um, and so when a military does that, it becomes the target of the other military. So in the case of this particular place, this, um, this school was occupied by the Russian military advancing eastward or advancing westward in Eastern Ukraine. Um, 
And then they were counterattacked by the Ukrainian military and they were repelled. And so the damage is from both sides, if you will. Um, it's not just uh, one assault, it's multiple assaults. Um, and so that's where you're seeing a, a destroyed uh, school. But the story behind this, um, again, is that schools, hospitals, and other public buildings are often the targets of, of military operations. Um, in Ukraine, along the about 620 mile front line um, that goes in south and eastern Ukraine, there are some 400 schools and hospitals that look like this, that have been heavily damaged or entirely destroyed due to the conflict. And so again, what that means is um, even in places of relative calm, those schools and hospitals that were destroyed are no longer functioning and serviceable, meaning the people cannot access basic services. And this again is oftentimes where humanitarian assistance comes in to try to reestablish together with the government some level of basic assistance to people who are returning to their homes. Um, I have I think one more. Yeah. Um, this is um, uh, my last photo of Ukraine. What you're seeing here is uh, a librarian at a small town uh, school. And if you look closely at the books behind her and, and to her right, you'll see that there's some kind of water damage and that there's, it's kind of broken and busted up a little bit. Um, so what has happened in this school is the, uh, the roof was damaged due to fighting. There's holes in the roof. And over the summer, the rains came and, and rained down on not just the library, but many other parts of the school and have really damaged and, and, and um, you know, to, to a very deep extent, this school. And so I came to this school to, to see if there was anything that um, we could do as a humanitarian organization. I had the opportunity to speak with the librarian. So um, anyway, th this is what you're seeing in this picture. It's a damaged uh, library, but the story behind this picture I found really interesting. The, the school was so damaged as to be almost destroyed or almost a write-off. I, I, I'm not uh, an expert on that, but it would be very expensive to fix it. So I asked her as she was kind of sweeping and cleaning, what are you doing? Like, what, what's going on? And uh, she said very plainly that school is starting in a month and a half. I'm getting this ready for my students. We're going to go ahead one way or another. We are going to hold school this fall. Uh, and, and so with that, and then if you look at this picture, you can't miss a very determined look on this person's face. And the story behind this picture is I, I had the very good fortune to meet with a lot of Ukrainians um, in, in my short time there. And I, I do speak Russian, and so I'm able to communicate at, 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 you know, with people very directly. And um, I, I want to say that the Ukrainians I met were all characterized very similarly as this librarian. They, I, I never picked up the sense of, um, um, you know, that th things were terrible and that uh, there was nothing to be done and that, you know, we should just, you know, just kind of pack it in. Um, quite the contrary, from Ukrainians that I met, uh, I would say that the, the librarian here typifies most Ukrainians who, um, understand that they're in the middle of a terrible conflict. They don't want anything to do with that. They, they would prefer to have peace, but they're not going to have it stop them um, in, in attempting to live the life um, that they want to live um, in, in peace and in freedom. And so um, again, I, I, and when I look back at um, Phyllis's remarks, you know, I see so many connections, uh, particularly between the idea of empathy and communication. Uh, which is, is so key, and especially in a situation like this, where you're talking with people whose lives have been turned upside down and have a very certain kind of human approach um, to things and to be able to communicate in a way that draws out what is really happening, what might the actual needs be, and how might humanitarians then be able to meet some of those needs. So those are the things I wanted to share with you on Ukraine and a, a little bit um, with regard to um, uh, the, the book. And I'll stop there, Phyllis, and I think, uh, do we take some questions? Okay.